Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today is a very unique program, a special program. Our topic is remote viewing and channeling. My guest is Angela Ford, who is one of the least well-known but most successful remote viewers. She was for 10 years part of the Army remote viewing program in Fort Meade, Maryland. This program was not originally recorded for New Thinking Aloud. It was recorded by Deborah Lynn Katz. And Deborah has kindly, and Deborah and Angela have kindly allowed us to show it on the New Thinking Aloud channel. Deborah has been a guest several times on New Thinking Aloud. She is currently the president of the International Remote Viewing Association. She is author of a number of books, including You Are Psychic, The Art of Clairvoyant Reading and Healing. Extraordinary Psychic, Proven Techniques to Master Your Natural Psychic Abilities, Freeing the Genie Within, Manifesting Abundance, Creativity, and Success in Your Life, and co-authored with John Knowles, Associative Remote Viewing, The Art and Science of Predicting Outcomes for Sports, Politics, Finance, and the Lottery. I am actually hopeful that Deborah will become a regular guest host contributor to the New Thinking Aloud channel, and perhaps this interview will be her first contribution. And now I'll switch over to the recording made by Deborah and Angela. Angela, I wanted to reach out to you because one of the things that I've been experiencing lately is as you know, for a long time, I've been involved in all different kinds of psychic practices. So clairvoyant reading and then uh, remote viewing for a long time and mediumship as well. And mediumship is something that I've really been immersing myself in lately. And I've been having some experiences where during the course of that, of connecting with or attempting to connect with someone who's passed over, I have been shown things about their house. And one example was I was going to be meeting with this older woman who had recently lost her husband. And I thought, well, I'll just see if I can get any connection with the husband before I go over there. And I immediately had an image of a refrigerator and the refrigerator, it was the lower left part of the refrigerator, actually the freezer. And there was a light on that one side and it was blinking on and off. And the picture was so clear. And when I went over to her house, I felt a little funny saying something as mundane about, you know, what was happening in her, in her refrigerator. But I felt that her husband was trying to let me know that that he was real, that he was really communicating. And when I told her about the refrigerator, she was like, oh my gosh, no one else has been in my refrigerator. No one knows that that's exactly what's been going on is a flashing light right in that place. And she said that was the one thing that she, she didn't even care about like messages from her husband or anything. She just wanted to know that he was still, his consciousness was still there. And so the point of all of this is within remote viewing communities lately, of which I'm part of many, there seems to be a, a very strict divide between what we're doing over here as remote viewing and any other psychic practices are just fine, yeah, but, that. but that's not remote viewing. That's not what we're doing. We're not that's supposed okay. to talk about Remote viewing was coined by the two scientists in 1976 or the early, earlier 1970s. Prior to remote viewing, if you went into scientific labs, if you went into Durham with Ryan and Ryan, if you went to Princeton, 
these people were calling it ESP, extrasensory perception. So when you say remote viewing, it is nothing more than extrasensory perception. So that's all it is. It's the same thing. Now, the remote viewers, they don't like that. It's remote viewing, and somehow they think that that differentiates themselves from the rest of what's going on over here. But when you perform a psychic feat, whether it's the automatic writing, the channeling, the CRV with the ideogram, the ERV, tarot cards, a crystal ball, ruins, that is only the manifestation of the information. The information goes here and then it manifests there. So as far as I'm concerned, remote viewers are doing the same thing as anybody who does practices ESP, but they don't wanna hear that. They're not, that would make them like the gypsy on the street or the psychic with the little house out with the palm. It's all the same, it's the same thing. To me. Yeah. And so I think a lot of times the idea with remote viewing is that it's part that it's within a specific protocol or a setup where you don't know information in advance and you have it planned out and there's a way to, to structure it's it and a, analyze. Yeah, it's, and it's feedback. It's based on feedback. And that way the scientists can get their um statistics. It's all based on feedback. And if, if, if it's right, it's right. And then they can receive their statistics. But I know when I do a reading, sometimes you need, like if I'm doing a reading, I need the feedback, you need, then I can move on. If you get the feedback while you're doing a reading, like if I can say, well, was your husband's name John? And they go, oh, yeah, that was John. That frees me up from that. And then I can move on. So if you need the feedback, even in a reading, mm -hmm. you ever feel like that? Yeah. Um, and I, I think that this separation of, okay, over here, I'm doing remote viewing over here, I'm doing mediumship. I think that that divide in many ways, maybe cutting us off from actually even enhancing our abilities or being oh, able to right. really make use. Oh, that's of true. Them. That's how, that's how we felt. We had a one girl that was, she came in, she was in the military. Her name was Linda Thompson, Thomas or Thompson. And she was in the military and she was young. And of course she was in the military. So the military had her and she was a CR, you know, CRB. She had no clue as to this. She, I don't know why she came through regular military channels where that, her next assignment was put with us. So how that happened, it was very rare because if she would have been interviewed or found, we probably wouldn't have taken her. But she was brought in and she, you could, I mean, she was just all new to this and she had fear in her. And I think Lynn Buchanan trained her, which is very kind and gentle. Well, she got to the end of CRV. And I'll tell you what, she wasn't a bad remote viewer. And you could see, you could almost see her third eye. She was getting ready to open up. I mean, you could see it. That third eye was just flaming and she just looked different. And it was like, oh my God, you know, she's there. She actually could go to the next level she had such fear in her and that they would not allow it. But even the manager at the time, Fern Govin, you know, he tried to, you know, say, hey, do you want this? Let's try the, you know, let's try the channeling. She was much too much in fear of it, but she was there. She was opening up. So, so that's a free will choice, I guess. I mean, it's some, it's a free will choice. So I don't know, but oh no, they hate it. And the thing is, is, they knew what channeling was. Was when I went in there, they were all. I mean, this, remember the Seth materials, Jane Roberts and Seth. Yes. I mean the the Seth books were there, so they believed in the trans channeling. Um, and Ed Dames was there, and Dames was very much, you know, interested in UFOs, trans channeling. I would say Paul Smith was probably the only one that was so uptight about everything, because. Skip Atwater was into 
the channeling. Now, the people that brought this in, the forefathers, like uh, Dale Graff, Dr. Verona, um, Skip Atwater, even Ed Dames, were, they knew about, you know, channeling, tarot. They had all of this background. I don't think remote viewing is anything new. I think the term, they, they rely so much on the terminology and that's what they did. But when you talk to people like Dr. Verona and Dale Grant, they knew it was terminology and, and Dr. Verona needed a certain terminology to sell it to Congress. And that's all he wanted it for. Dr. Verona, now what was his position again? Within- he was very high up. So he was still interested in this parapsychology stuff. And he found out that Stanford Research Institute was doing research in it. So he gave them a little bit of money to do some research. In the meantime, there was a guy by the name of Dale Graff who was in Ohio. He was with the foreign technology, foreign technology division. He was working as a civilian for the Air Force. And Dale, was very psychic himself. And Dale, I don't know if you ever heard, who was the art, who was the pilot that would go through the Arctic and fly? He was an Arctic explorer and he wanted people on the ground to, see, to send messages to. Do you remember that? He was a pilot and he was exploring the Arctic and he wanted people on the ground to give ESP to in case anything ever happened to him with his radio that he so he would do ESP tests. So Dale was wired into all of this. And in the meantime, in the intelligence community, there's intelligence reports that go out. And it doesn't matter who puts them out, if it's State Department, if it's CIA, if it's DIA, if it's Army Intelligence, but you get these reports. So there's these reports, they come under science and technology, and these reports are coming out from a source that the Russians are doing this um, ESP stuff. So Dale starts looking into all of this and he's putting out the, the reports in the intelligence community, Verona's picking them up. So he calls Dale and says, hey, I'm interested in this, follow this for me. So Dale said, not a problem. So Dale received an award from where he was working and they were gonna give him a sabbatical for one year. He could go out and research and do anything he wanted. Well, what he did was he wanted to spend time at Princeton. He wanted to spend time at um, SRI. He wanted to go to Durham and he, he, he was gonna do ESP research for one year. Well, when the commander of the agency of the FTD, Foreign Technology Division, found out, he took the award away from Dale and said, you can't do this. So Dr. Verona said, hey, Dale, come on up here. I'll get you. I'll give you a job. (laughs) But I think by that time, Verona moved from CIA to DIA. And Verona was like, just come on up. I'll, um, I'll make you a job. I got a job for you. So he created Dale a job. So Dale and his family moved up here and Dale actually started to work under Verona. And then they started to tap into Stanford research and all of this. Now that was on one side. On the other side, you had Skip Atwater was working up at the Pentagon level with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he, and and they and he whoever was the head of intelligence in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Atwater convinced this guy this stuff exists. Let's make a team of remote viewers. So they did a little army unit, and it fell under Army Intelligence, and that was located up at Fort Meade, Maryland. So you had a handful of your little army officers that comprised of remote viewers. Now they may have had a few civilians in there, but it was mostly military. Now, this came from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But in the meantime, there was a guy by the name of Bert Stubblebein, who was a general, and he was a general out in Arizona at the, at the, tra- tra- at the training, Army training. But he was interested in all of this. Ben, he bent spoons. He, you know, did you ever see the movie Men Who Stare at Goats? 
Yes. Yeah, he was that guy. I mean, he walked through walls. He thought, you know, he was just, he thought he could move cloud. He had his right hand man, John Alexander. So they were always looking for, um, you know, people with these abilities because he was in army intel and he, whoever he saw, he would place up at Fort Meade. That's how Lynn got there. So finally, Stubblemine came to be ahead of the, Arm, the Army Intelligence Command where I was working. And it was there that he allowed people to start going down to the Monroe Institute on Fridays. So, and that, and actually he was ahead of the viewers. But in the meantime, you had Verona and Dale operating independently from the Army, but still, if the viewers remote, were remote viewing, Dale and Verona saw those results. Uh, they, of course, they saw the operation. Their hands were in it. Yeah. Even though they were separate, their hands were, if you're going to work an operation, they want to see the results. They wanted, pe- they wanted people out at SRI, you know. So even though they, even though Verona didn't actually manage the remote viewers, their hands were in it. So Stubblebein resigned in 1984. At that time, they thought that the program would just go away because you lost the support from the, from the, uh, from the Pentagon, from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Whoever supported that, they went away. Stubblebein went away. So they, from what I understood, was these people were sitting around at Fort Meade waiting for their orders for their next assignment, because you know how they assign military people. So they were sitting around thinking, okay, wherever they go, they're going to go. And it was in 1984 that Stubblebine resigned. And, and I think I had the impression he was trying to get me into the program, but then he resigned and I thought, ah, it's, you know, it's bye-bye time. Now I didn't understand this at the time, but this is what happened. When Stubblebine resigned, Verona went to Congress and said, do not shut the program down. Just take those slots, take those people, slots, they called them billets, take them out of the Army and just transfer them over to the Defense Intelligence Agency. And it took about a year and a half to do that. And then that's what, and that would have been in 1985, that program was revitalized now under the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I got hired in 1986. Wow. That's how that happened. So, so Ver- Verona was no slouch. He was Dale Graff was no slouch. I, and I tell you, they they had a guy, and there were people that was putting a lot of money in the research. There was a three-star general. He was the head of the Air Force's Intelligence Medical Command. He was a medical doctor. He was a genetic doctor. He put a lot of money into, like, stamp everything. He put in a lot of money to, to parapsychology research. And when he went to retire, he knew how to work the system that he kept the money in for that parapsychology research for 10 years after he retired. So those were those are the big boys. Those, yeah. <laughs> those are the big boys. Well, and do you do you remember that general's name? And also, was it his own personal money or was it money from the government? Oh no, you mean General Ratman, the the, the Air Force guy. Yeah. Oh no, no, it was money from the intelligence. You know, intelligence money. You have these programs and you're supposed to every year you pro, you know, it's called the G-dip or something. No, it wasn't his own personal money. He knew how to take money out of the intelligence budget to put it where he wanted it to go into parapsychology research for 10 years after he retired. I mean, that's the big boys. So how did Stubblebein discover you? How did you first get hooked up with any of these people? And then how did that progress for you personally? Stubblebine was looking for people. He Stubblebine, okay, he was taking people down to the Monroe Institute every Friday evening. And they would come back on Monday morning, Monday, Sunday nights. And I was the time I was learning, I was doing channeling and I was working at the I was going to the Mansbridge Institute in Arlington, Virginia. You were also an employee at that time. I was an employee with the with the army. I worked for the FBI. I came into 
Army Intelligence as an intern. I got a job. I was working Central American Current Affairs. I was working Noriega, the Sandinistas, the, the insurgency in Honduras and in El Salvador. Well, what happened was I had heard about Stubblebine taking these trips down to the Monroe Institute and I wanted to go. And there was a woman named Charlene Schufelt. She married General Schufelt. So if you ever wanted to go, you had to go see Charlene. So I say, hey, Charlene, sign me up. So she did. And then she called me up and she said, you can't go, Angela. Some general, some colonel from Hawaii is coming over because he wants to go to Monroe. So I was kicked off the list. I know. So I said, okay, well, put me down for next time. So she put me down for next time. Then she gave me a call. She says, okay, you can't go this time, she said. Somebody, another colonel from somewhere was coming from New Jersey, and we have to take you off the list. And I said, okay, well, the third time she came me in and she said, look, she said, I can, this is a shame what's happening to you. She said, I'm going to, I'm going to really push this for you. She said, I'm going to um, get you on this list. Well, when I looked at the list, I saw two names on the list and I said, no, take me. I'm not going. Now, the two names were a man by the name of Doug Pat. And Doug Pat wanted his partner to be a Major Finch. I was, I was working with Major Finch at the time. He sat right behind me. He was arrogant. He was um, very military. And I thought, I'm not going down to spend the relaxing weekend to be with this jerk. I got to put up with him all week. <laughs> and I knew Doug because Doug worked in our office and he was kind of pompous and a little, you know, but he was more sweet than Finch. He had a soft spot. And I thought, you know what? And, and then they called, they called Pat. He was working up at the main office or something. And I just thought, you know what? I, it's just something told me that don't go. Well, that was the weekend that I guess Pat kind of went crazy. His Kundalini kind of went out. So they came back and Stubblebine got in trouble. And it was a bad, it was a bad situation. It was a bad situation. Oh. So I think what happened was there was another young girl. She was working in the office with a very good friend of mine. And she knew Stubblebine and she knew Colonel Alexander. And I think she was the one that brought me in to meet them because they knew I was trying to get on the list. They knew that I had, um, no, they knew that I was doing, they knew I was interested in it, but Alexander knew I had the abilities whenever he found out I was doing channeling and I was going to, and I was attending the Mansbridge Institute. So they brought me in to see Stubblebine and it was nice. We just talked or whatever. And he, you know, he, by that time he knew he was retiring and everything. And um, I think I gave him a reading. He was really, really nice, but I never asked him for a job or, you know, I, I just never, you know, asked it to go anywhere or anything. And that was about it. I think I met with him a couple of times. Um, I think I met with him a couple of times. Now, my management got upset with me because, you know, they had, you know, I, I, I didn't go through my command to get to him. They were so pissed. I mean, they were really mad at me. <laughs> but you met with the general to give him a psychic reading. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Huh, I wonder why they would be pissed about that. Yeah, and you know, it's the thing, you know, and so anyway, Stubblebine more or less, I mean, he just he just went after them. He was, he was like, mind your own damn business. But they waited until after he left, and then they really got me. They said they needed to send me to Walter Reed to get a psychiatric evaluation to see if I was oh, no. crazy. Oh, no. And they did that to me. And they said, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was. It was terrible. Um, but they they got me. And then they then they kind of took my job away and I went up to the attic and worked and didn't do anything. But the guy from but I think Stubbleby knew they were gonna come after me because there he had there was a psychologist on staff. And he he must have told the psychologist to watch after me because the psychologist really whenever um 
he went after them. He was like, what's, you know, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, so she does something or does something that you don't know. It's a different, I don't know what he said. I don't even want to know what he said, but I do believe that he was, he was working on my behalf because of stumble bond, but I did meet with the psychologist at Fort Meade. They said I wasn't crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been there myself for. Yeah, for- and I came back and it was kind of like, oh, you know, I, my boss tried, to, I could tell he tried to make it up to me and I just couldn't. He tried to be, I think he was ashamed. I think he was embarrassed. I think he was sorry. He should have just talked to me. He went behind my back. And by that point, I, I just couldn't deal with him. And then I think he had me up in the attic And I was hardly doing anything, which was okay. I remember we'd put music up there and dance. And my briefings were good. My briefing, they liked my briefings. They took me away from the current, the briefings every week. So every once in a while I would brief and it was okay. But I, I just, I, it was like, I didn't, it was dark days. I had no idea what was going to happen to me. Where was I going to go? What was going to happen? And then in 1986, in January or February, Paul Smith came down and started to interview me for the job. Wow. And I was there by July. And so were you working then in the unit full time after that at Fort Meade? They were full time. Oh, we were there full time. We were full there. You, I don't know how people could have worked it part time. Yeah. And how, how many years were you there? I was there nine years. You know, I did not realize you were there for that long. 1986 to 1995, I was there till it closed. Wow. And so when you would be doing your work, um, can you talk about like, were you aware at times like, yes, I am really channeling, like where it really felt like. Oh, I can channel. I did my channeling came through automatic writing. So as soon as I did, I was not allowed to do automatic writing. Um, when I first went to the unit, I swear to God, I had one foot in the door and one foot was still on the step. And Skip Atwater said, I know who you are. I've heard about you and you have a very bad habit. You will not be doing that in this unit. I was not allowed to do my channeling. So I was trained in extended remote viewing. And I, and I, and after going to a psychiatrist and after going through all of that, where I could have lost my job because I skipped the chain of command, I just knew you don't fight this. So I said, okay, I said, okay. <laughs> Um, sure, I'm, I'm not going to channel. I'll do whatever you say. And they gave me a guy by the name of Gene Lessman to train. And Gene was a civilian and he was over in Germany working. And as a civilian and working overseas, you're only allowed to stay so many years. And I think his three years were up and he needed a job and he knew he knew um, Bill Ray, the manager of the unit. And I think Bill was his friend and Bill got him a job. So Gene had nothing. He had no experience with this stuff. Wow. And all he knew was I was channeling <laughs> spirits. And, oh, he, he didn't like it. He, it just repelled him. And he said, and you better not bring in, you know, your spirit. You know, and he just, oh, my God, he'd go on. So anyway, he was, he was just full of it, though, too. So what happened after a while I was there, must have been a year, year and a half. I'd go over and work with Gene, and Gene would say, oh, I love working with, B- oh, Gene Lessman worked with Bill Ray, me, and Lynn Buchanan. We were the three that were still in the extended remote viewing. Bill Ray never got trained in coordinate remote viewing. He wouldn't, he wouldn't get trained in it. Joe wouldn't get trained in it. And Lynn was going to get trained in it. But at that time, there were only us three that were doing the extended remote viewing. And so Gene Lessman was working with us. With us. And um, I was going over there. And all of a sudden, Gene's saying, oh, I love working with Bill. The angels come in and they... He's so holy and he's talking about these angels coming into session that are with 
Beetle, and I'm like losing it. I'm like, you know, you're yelling at me for my channel, but it's okay that he has his guides come in, but mine can't come in. So I used to go back to the unit and I used to tell him, I said, I don't understand why I can Bill Ray channel, but I can't. <laughs> and would laugh and say, Angela, that's because Bill's the boss. <laughs> He's in charge. <laughs> but think about it. Is that so silly or what? Yeah, my gosh. So here, here you are, you're having to tell your guides or mm -hmm. don't, don't come near me. I can't make use of you while I'm doing my psychic work. I have to do it how they want me to. So, how, so how is that going for you at that time? Like, are you still, well, I, was, I was doing good in, I was doing good in extended remote viewing. I was doing very well. I mean, Skip Atwater liked my work. Gene Lessman liked my work. I had good hits with, I think the, the pyramids with the, with the uh, St. Louis Arc. And then they put me in operations. And you know what? We used to do operations and most of them were against the structure of the Soviet Union. And they would write up the little reports, you know, like viewer 079 said this, viewer 001 said this. And as long as I was fitting in, as long as I was fitting in and, and my work maybe, you know, could, went, it agreed with somebody's work, as long as I fit in, everything was fine. Everything was fine. I kept my mouth shut. I did my remote viewing. The CRV people, they were military. They really didn't pay that much attention to me. I was used to that because I worked with Finch and his group. And I, I knew what it was like to even have female officers come in at low rank and getting more respect than me. It's a military way. So they really didn't pay attention to me because I used to sit there. I came in late, so I would have to leave later. And these people would wait till the end of the day and they would go in the back room in the conference table and have CRV meetings without the boss, Fern, being there. And Jeannie, the secretary, told Fern, she says they're having meetings without you. And they were. But um, what were but they I did, what were they oh, doing? CRV, CRV, CRV. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Structure, structure, structure. So anyway, so it went like that for a while. And, you know, I was just sitting there. Well, they brought in Fern Govan as the operations officer because Fred wanted to retire, which, which that happened. Bill Ray had retired. So... I don't know who they brought in. I think maybe Colonel Zanakis, but he didn't last long. And there was a change. There was a change. Put off and, and uh, Targ were gone. Ed May was in place by 1985. So there was this change. There was this change. And Fern became the operations officer. And he used to be a viewer. He was an original viewer from the 1970s. And then he left the unit to go do something. And then he came back and he came in and he said, I don't, he didn't want to hear about CRV because he heard about it, heard, heard it all before. And he, he was like, John Mc, Ma, he says, do what you do, what you need to do. He said, I'll do what you need to do to get the information. Well, at that time, Mel Riley was into, um, the pendulum or dowsing. Paul took a big interest in dowsing. And I said, well, I do automatic writing. And Fern was like, fine. And then Ed May was of the same. He didn't really care. As long as you, as long as you followed the, the protocol, they didn't care what methodology you used to get information. So I told Fern, I wanted to try my automatic writing. So he said, okay. Now, I didn't, at that time, I really didn't know how I was going to do automatic writing with, um, with structures, or, you know, things like that you can describe in ERV. So I wasn't quite sure about that, but I knew it would work with personalities. So one time Fern gave me a personality. I did not know it was a personality at the time. And more or less, he was letting me work on my own or he'd give you things that you work on your own. And I said, hey, if you really want, if you're really interested at that point, I was just about had it because these people were having CRV meetings behind my back. They brought in a new girl, Gabby, who was um, uh, Army. 
she retired from the army, but she was still a reservist. I had to put up with her because, and she didn't, she just came in because she knew Ed Danes. And by that time I was just disgusted. And I was thinking I gave up a lot to come to this unit. And they weren't interacting you with, like they just kind of put you in a room and weren't friendly to mm-hmm. you or anything. Yeah. So I said, you know what, Fern, if you really, I said, if, you, if you're interested, if you're interested in me and what I'm doing, you come and you look at this. Well, I didn't know it, but the target happened to be Terry Anderson. He was in, he was, a, he was a uh, Lebanon hot as blow up. So I got him, I, I called him trees. I said, he's not from this country. He's in another, he's being held captive. Um, you know, I said, but he will come out alive and just on and on and on. And well, Fern just about, you know, he couldn't believe it. So he came back and Jeannie said, you know, you have to keep an open mind. (laughs) You know, Fern, you just have to keep an open mind. (laughs) He goes, my mind is on the floor. He said, I can't believe. He said, he said, Angela, you're good. He said, well, let's work this. Let's see what else we can. Well, we started to do personalities. We did, I think, Khomeini. We started doing things and we, we were getting some good results. So doctor, so Fern went up to see Dr. Verona. And he said, hey, I've got somebody there that's, um, you know, look, this is what I'm getting. This is in Verona. In Verona goes, well, yeah, use it, do it, you know? And he goes, yeah, he's in, he goes, yeah. He said, but the other people, they don't like it. And, and, um, and Verona says, you think you can handle it? And Frank goes, yeah. So the other people said that it was never tested in an operational mode. But we didn't, and Fern was like, oh, who cares? It's, it's, we're doing it. You know, it's, it's working the way the intelligence community works. You collect the information, you give it to the analyst. If they feel that it's worth acting on, they'll act on it. And that's what we were doing. What you did was especially helpful in terms of tuning into people and getting information. People. It was all personalities. It, they're, they're, and it was locations, locations. We did a lot. We started to do a lot with drug interdiction. We were getting small vessels. We weren't getting anything big, but they would, would, would get a vessel and would say, yeah, yeah, it's going there. It's going up to Martha's Vineyard. And they, and they would call back, oh, yeah, yeah. It was right where I said it was going. And these were, this wasn't any big splash, but to us, we were like, oh my God, oh my God. And, um, and I had Jeannie, the secretary, and she said, ah, you know, Angela, you're doing good. She says, and who, she says, this is wonderful, but whoever knows, who, you know, maybe we'll get a big one someday. Maybe we won't. Well, we did get a big one one day. We got that old salt. We, I was able to get out in the Pacific Ocean. It was the largest drug bust. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How that, like, how did you get the information for that and, and what ended up happening with that? Now, okay, what happened was, was we were doing a lot of s- small vessels, and I didn't realize it at the time, but apparently when the vessels would come in from, from down south, when they would try to come into the United States, if we could get them before they went to the, be, before they went to the Panama Canal, we could get a lot of information on what, what the plans were. But once they reached the Panama Canal, we couldn't get any information afterwards. And I don't know why. Hmm. But when we talked to the people down in Florida that we worked for, they said that that that's the same thing with them. Once those ships hit, once these ships, they're dirty ships. That means I thought they were dirty like they needed clean, but it meant they had drugs on them. (laughs) (laughs) once they hit the Panama Canal you couldn't so we were having a lot of small successes nothing nothing great what happened was is we got a call one day and they said hey where was the old salt they believed I didn't know this but apparently it had a lot of drugs on it and all Fern did was we went across the room and he said Angela they're look, San Francisco called, they're looking for a vessel called the Old Salt. All I could wish, all I knew, my feeling was it was a large vessel. That's all I knew. So they want to they know where is it? Well, 
that meant, so I, so what I did was more like dowsing. When you do automatic writing, you can douse too. It's the same thing. You're just doing this, this, this. So I said, Fern, we had a huge map of the, you know, the world. We went to the Pacific Ocean. I said, Fern, just take your finger and start moving it. And I was channeling and I'd say, okay, go down, go down, now go to the left. Okay, stop there, stop there. Okay, make an X, okay. Move around, move around, move around. Okay, go there. And then we had spots. Okay, but go here. And then it was finally, that's it. I would say, that's it. It's right there. Put your finger right there. That's where it is. So Fern put the little X. So we had to run down the information to Dale. And so I ran it down from Fort Meade down to DC. I think it was about a 45 minute drive. So Dale had a map and it was a smaller map of the Pacific Ocean. And I was trying to tell him where it was on the smaller map, but I couldn't do it because we were working with the bigger map. So I called Fern and I said, hey Fern, do you remember where your finger was? And he said, yes, they did get me the coordinates. So he goes, okay, wait a minute. So he had to go out of one, one structure, room, structure, he went to the remote viewing structure, wrote down the coordinates and he gave them to Dale. So they called them in. And then what happened was, the, I guess these people were sitting around and they said, you know, we have nothing else to do or nothing better to do. Let's just take a helicopter ride to see if that's where it is. It was right on the coordinate. They went right out and that was the vessel right there. And the people on the vessel knew they started to throw the drugs overboard. So they did get the drugs. They got the people. They said it was the largest drug bus since the military, in the military. And I had a cousin that lived out in California and she said she was watching the news one night and she said, I was mesmerized. She said, I don't know, Angela. She said, I never really watch the news. I'm usually too busy, but I stopped to hear this story. And I was so pulled into this story about this drug bust. And I said, that was me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it, um, they found it because you were channeling, you put your finger on the right spot on the map and that was the exact coordinates. Yeah, no, I mean, but I still had my guides working with me, but they were saying not there, there, no, 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 go up higher, go lower, go left. Now, that's how I do my searches. Some people call it dowsing, but I need my guides. I need my, to do that. See, oh. now the rest of the team called that dowsing and they thought that, that they thought it was in the finger. They called it the fat finger search. They thought it was in the in. It wasn't in the finger. It was in the channeling. Describe the channeling, if you can. Like, what were you, are you hearing voices? Mm -hmm. Are you hearing, like, no, in your it's head? Just, no, it's just the pen on the paper, and you write, and it's words. You're writing but, words. But so when, like, when you, because you started to say, well, they said, like, like go over to the left. Like, are you feeling that? Or in no. your mind, are you getting the thought, go to the left? It's, it's, but they're like writing it. it. It's, they're writing it. Somehow it's entering my mind, but they're writing it on paper. They write it. Through like, your hand. Through my hand. Oh yeah. It's my hand is on the paper and it's written. I've written my children's stories like that. People write books like that. It is written. And if someone was going to say, well, how, how do you know it's not just um, your own psychic abilities how do you know that it's coming from an outside source like what are you experiencing that gives you that confidence that it's it's um, because, um, because I just know when my guides are there doing doing the hand I just know when they're there there's I mean, a difference in your hand and theirs or, or their oh, my hand can't yeah my hand would not if if I took my guides out of the automatic writing I could not do automatic writing. It wouldn't be psychic. It's they're there. I mean, they're there with the hand. It's automatic writing with the guides. Like usually with dowsing or for searches, they can work quicker because we're not going for descriptions or personnel. You know, they'll go right there, you know, or I'll say, is it there? No, no, no. Is it there? Yeah, right there. So, so it, if they can work faster, but oh, absolutely. I could never do if. I would not be doing automatic if I'm writing and I don't have them. It's not automatic writing. But and I know at some point when I do a reading, some of it's me, some of it's the clairvoyancy. 
you know, some of it's the guides. It's almost when you're doing all of this, everything's coming, but it doesn't matter what you're using as long as you're getting the information. Do you, does your body feel different when the guides are there? Like, do you have any? No, because I don't do trans channeling. I'm not, I'm not. Now they said, I think in one book they wrote that I was a trans channeler, but I'm not. No. That's totally something different. Have you ever had it where you just started to walk around and then you went to the right place or was there other ways it manifested through your body? I've heard how Ingo was actually taken out on a boat. And then as the boat was going through the water, he was able to say, okay, go to the left, go to the right. And then, the oh top. yeah, I know they did that to me down in Florida, but um, they tried, they would, they took us down to Florida and California to do drugs or whatever. Um, it, that didn't really, but it's, I, I never had much success that way. Did you ever do work like that? You know, not, not really, besides for just like, if I've lost something that's nearby, sometimes I'll just imagine I'm grounding myself. And then I'll imagine I'm grounding, like giving myself a grounding cord and the object, a grounding cord. And then I'll just walk around and then I might be led to something, but I, I've just mostly just worked with paper or yeah, just the tools right here. I, I've, kind of had, I mean, maybe I haven't done it enough, but it just feels to me like I'd have more success with my paper than actually yeah, I don't, as a direction too. So they made us travel or whatever and, you know, take us out and, you know, what do you, and nothing I ended up, I'd end up sitting in the room just doing the pen and paper. But it, and did you find it more distracting? Like if they took you out somewhere, cause yeah. now you have all these, I didn't need it. I didn't need, I really needed a, fo- I just needed night, you know, quiet peace and a focus. Cause I, that was the time they took me down Florida and they were asking, they do this thing where they don't even target it. Just anything you can get, they call it like a, you know, you just kind of scout around and see what you can get. And I can remember I was getting this vessel. I kept, I kept, there was a Clint Eastwood movie calling called um, Hang 'em High. There was, and I kept getting hang them high about a vessel. And I said, oh, it's dirty. And I didn't realize it at the time, but dirty meant there was a lot of drugs on it. I said, boy, that vessel is dirty. You better go clean it out. Well, here, their vessel was a small vessel. It was called hangers. And they knew the owner and it was filled with drugs. So you were doing this work really for eight years, nine years. Nine years, nine that's, years. That's a long time. And so you must have been up for a review quite a bit. I mean, I got my, well, I got a promotion from Dr. Verona. He definitely promoted me. And then that was, and that was about the highest I could go. And then I just started to get in skin grades, but they never, oh man, I found that guy, when I found the guy out in uh, Wyoming, that I said, I want the, I want the reward money. They said, oh, you're only doing your job, but they would never, the milk, they would never have given me anything not with or not with not with that I mean they hated me these people hated me because I mean, of they their, were, what because of their biases with how you they work. hated me they, they really did they tried to say I was a Soviet spy because I lived near the Soviet embassy they tried to have my clearances pulled do you think this would have been happening to you if you weren't a woman if you had been a man? um probably they say, you know, they say, mm-hmm. oh, no, we, we're not, you know, I'm not so much a civilian. So it was being the civilian. I didn't wear the uniform. So that was more so more. than gender, probably. And, I didn't wear. And so was that. And how dare I walk in with the ability whenever they're just trying to figure it out. How did that not affect your, I mean, I'm just so amazed this is such a testament to your strength that with everything going on socially feeling like people didn't want you to be there and then people are telling you you can't work more determined more determined more determined but I knew but they didn't understand that I worked for the military prior to going into that office and I worked at a much higher echelon I mean these to me these were the little boys I was with the big boys 
I briefed generals. I had bosses that were colonels, full colonels. I worked at much higher echelons. And I, when I made when I made my other boss angry because I bypassed him, I went through all of that. So by the time I came to them and they were blackballing me, it was like I was already I already went be, I already went through that, and I knew what it was like. I worked in this tight. Um, Intel shop where we were, people were were reporting on current Intel, meaning not forecasting, but what was happening in the moment with people in, in the military. And, you know, I just watched how these military officers would get respect. I had younger lieutenants coming in, male and female, that would, that couldn't, that didn't even know their accounts yet you know it takes three to nine to six to nine months to know your account before you can even talk about it It didn't matter whether they knew their accounts or not they got more respect than I did so working at Fort Meade I was used to that but the fact that 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 they you know they didn't like my I was more determined than ever more determined than ever I was you know I was going to show them with the the case in Wyoming. Can you talk more about that, how that all started and, and then got resolved? It was the DEA agent that went bad. Can you talk about that case? Yeah, sure. That was an open case. That was with the B. He was on the 10 most wanted list. That's what customs got a hold of Dr. Verona and said, hey, and they said, hey, this guy's on the 10 most wanted list. There was a TV program called the 10 most wanted. He was on that TV program. So I guess Dale, Dale came down or Dale must have called Fern and, or whatever, and they're looking for this man. So I, did, I didn't know absolutely nothing. And so Fern said, come on, we're going to go to work. So I went in and Jeannie came with us because Jeannie, she was the secretary and she loved to take notes. And um so we were sitting there, we're getting ready. And Fern looked at me and he said, where's Charles Jordan? And I put my pen to the paper and I said, he's in Lowell, L-O-W-E-L. I said, he's in Lowell, Mount Lowell, Wyoming. And so we're sitting there, you know, and I said, you know, Fern, I said, I think that's all I want to do because once I got the location, then everything flooded in, the drugs, once I got the drugs, I got the vessels. Once I got the vessels, I was in Florida. And then all the scenario came in. And I said, you know what? I think, I said, I think I'm going to leave because now I'm getting a whole other picture. And, and I, the guide said, was, Fern knew the guides. And so did, I said, the guide said, hello, Wyoming. Fern said, no. No, the level, level Wyoming. And Fern said, there's a, there's a level Massachusetts. I don't know if there's a level Wyoming. And Jeannie said, she said Wyoming. She said Wyoming. She didn't say Massachusetts. I said, Fern, it's, it's Wyoming. I said, just leave, you know, it's, that's it. So Fern took this little atlas book or something. He's looking, he's looking, he goes, well, there's a, there's a level Wyoming. I said, close enough. <laughs> Put it there. He's, close enough and I left well of course you know being government you just can't go with she said level why up they want more they want more they want more so anyway I said Fern you're not getting any more I this is this it's it's the best I can do something and told me something like you ha- you know you have it it's, there's nothing more to say well apparently Verona went to customs and he said, well, people had him in Florida. They had him in the Caribbean. He said, now we have a person who's pretty good at search. Or she's done good at, or this person has done good at search. And they said he's in Wyoming and in, in level Wyoming and customs said he would never be there. Um, they said he would never be there. He'd be in, you know, he wants the good life of warm water, you know, water and all of that. So anyway, about a month passed, about six weeks passed, about six weeks passed and Dale came up to the office. And I think 
he wanted me to work one more time or something. And I said, okay, I'll go over one more time. So anyway, we, I went over with Fern and Jeannie and I, and, you know, I started the writing and I said, Fern, I said, if, if they really want to get him, they better go now and catch him because I feel like he's moving east from level Wyoming. And I said, and I d- described this Indian burial, burial ground. And so, and it made a nice report, which made everybody happy because I went and worked again. And now they had a nice report from me. So Dale in Verona went to customs and they said, well, we went back to the person who um, is good at finding people and things. And they said that if you really want him, you have to go now because he's, he's moving east of Wyoming. He's west of Wyoming. And the customs guy said, as we are speaking, we are apprehending uh, Charles Jordan 100 miles east of Lovell, Wyoming. So, <laughs> so it was a Friday afternoon. Oh, my God. Fern called me and he said they found the guy. You got the hit. Nobody was around. Fern didn't want to tell the others because he didn't want them to feel bad. Well, I was so happy. Was he not wanting to upset the very same people that were doubting the way that mm-hmm. you worked? And now he doesn't even want to tell them because he's worried. He didn't, that want, he didn't want to tell them at the time. He did tell them later. He told them later. It was how he, you know, he just said, don't say he knew he had to tell them. He just, I don't think he, they, they put him through the ringer too. He was like, I'll tell him, just don't tell them, you know, I've got to figure out how I'm going to deal with this. But I was just happy. And I, Jeannie took off work. I called her. I said, hey, do you remember that guy we were working for? Well, they, they found him where I said he was. And Jeannie was like, oh, my God. <laughs> but so anyway, I said, Fern, I said, I want the reward money. We should get the reward money because and he said, no, you just did your job. Well, they said it was not. Oh, so anyway, they said they got a tip from a security guard that was working at Yellowstone National Park. So we never took credit for the hit. Well, the BBC came in 1995. The BBC came to where I live and Dale was my na- lived near me. They did a reenactment of the case and they brought the um, DEA man in, the, uh, got the agent who, um, the customs agent who backed it on, on our tip. And or he was the one that was ahead of the case. So they interviewed him for the reenactment or for the end. And, and we said, yeah, we didn't get the, the, and the custom said, are you kidding? He said, it was because of you. This 1995, this was, and I think I found the guy in 88 or 89. Now this is how many years later, this is what I found out. And this is what happened was, They didn't think he was in Wyoming, but about a month after I said he was in Wyoming, he sent his mother a picture of himself to show that he was okay. And the FBI saw a truck with Wyoming license plates. So at that point, they went up to Wyoming, FBI went to Wyoming and they were passing out pictures of him to, for people. And there was a security guard at at Yellowstone that found him, but the guy said, he said, no, it was because of you. Wow. So there, we found that out in 1995. It was the same with that big drug hit. They said there was another source. Oh yeah. There was another source that gave them right the coordinate. And then, and then years later they came out and admitted it. They didn't have another source. And I did Qaddafi's, um, I did Qaddafi's chemicals. Those ca- the, I found it, remember those chemicals? I found them on a boat. <laughs> did they ask you to do that formally? Like, will you look for the chemicals or did you know what you I were think they at? wanted to, yeah, they were looking for the, for them. And I said they were on a vessel and I called the, the potato. We called it the big potato. We, uh, we ended up calling it the big potato head. And we wrote up a little report and I think Dr. Verona saw the report on an analyst's desk and he said, do you know what that means? And he said, yeah, it's not potato, it's potato B, not a P, but a B. And he said, yeah, that's the vessel. That's a vessel in the Libyan inventory. So Verona went to the director of the agency in the general and he went to the director of operations and he said, we think we know what he, they're taking the chemicals 
out and putting them in by boat and we have the rendezvous, how they're doing it. Cause I explained like the, how they're doing it or what. And um, so they weren't going to do anything. And Verona said, this is from the same source that said this, this, and then I thought, Oh, okay. So they launched a submarine and it, they could not deny, they couldn't confirm, but they couldn't deny, but whatever I said was highly possible. And for that, when you, would you say it was your clairvoyance that get, gave you pictures of the ship? Well, that was automatic writing. Automatic too. And you, so you actually got every letter of the ship except for the first one. It was a P. Potato. We were spelling it P-O-T-A-T. We were spelling it like potato with a P, but it was actually spelled potato like a B. Yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty darn close. And that's what I'm saying. You can't, when then whenever we were doing the hostages, um, yeah, we were doing the hostages and we, I, I, you know, they want to know about the hostages. And I said, there was a man by the name of Livingston, Jonathan Livingston. I said, that's going to help in the release of the hostages. Well, no, the, the analysts at the time were, um, they were, they were looking through microfish. They couldn't find anybody with an American. They had no idea who I was talking about. Well, there was a guy named Higgins. He was captain. He was a hostage and he, he was in the military. His wife was in the military. And one of the analysts was over at the Pentagon visiting his wife, Robin. She, she was in the military and he was at, in her office and he saw my report on her desk. And he said, who's this living? He says, does this mean anything to you? Who's Livingston? And she said, oh, he's the envoy from England. He was just sent down to Beirut to negotiate the release of the hostages. And the, they, couldn't, they couldn't find him in the microfish because he was English. He wasn't American. He was not American. So when Terry Waite came out, he was the English he was the English hostage. He wrote a book and he credits this Livingston guy as breaking the, as he broke the, he, he, you know, he broke the barrier and he, he aided in the release of the hostages. Because wow. of and, and in your automatic writing, you came up with his full name oh and, and you said that he would be important in solving the case was that yeah, I said I said it's Jonathan Livingston it's going to help it's going to help <laughs> when when you're doing your writing are you writing full sentences or just words sometimes sometimes but mostly it's full sentences um given names you know I'm a lot quicker with it than I was when I first started out you know when you first start out you're looking at every word but but it's picked up a little bit, you know, it's, there's a, the momentum is picked up. And would you do sketching as well? Not, not mm -hmm. when I do automatic writing, it's very verbal. Okay. And before they were allowing you to, to work how you work best and telling you, so going back to, it sounded like they were having you do more extended remote viewing. So you weren't would you say at that point you weren't writing so much? You were just speaking? I'm sketching, sketching, drawing. And I'm, not, and I'm not much of a sketcher or drawing, but I was doing the best I could. Yeah. Did you feel like your work improved as you were given permission to work how you like to work? Or do you feel it was pretty consistent through the whole night? Oh, honey, I was hitting, no, I was off the charts. When I, when I could do what I wanted to do, I could find people. I could find places. I could... I, oh, I was off the charts and I knew I would, and, you know, I was off the charts and that made them mad. And I thought, you know, as long as I fit in and you could write my little paragraph in with everything and we all send it out, but my stuff was being acted on it immediately. This was, this was like, what is she saying? Where do we go? Then the, I think we did a, um, I think there was a hostage. They had, they had, there was an airplane where these Muslims held up an airplane and they called immediately. They said, what's going to happen? They were, and I said, nothing. And everybody got mad at me and here they let them go because it was Ramadan, <laughs> but they had me in there late one night. <laughs> what's going to happen? We got Americans on a plane. It's now they're being held hostage. I said, nothing and nothing happened. 
So you saw they were going to be totally fine. I said, what's going to happen? Oh, nothing. I didn't know if they were going to be okay. I was, I said, I'm really getting nothing. Sometimes mm-hmm. not getting anything is the answer. If there yeah. was something going to go on, you would, it would be coming to you. Has anyone come back to you and said, you know, we really didn't treat you well back then? Has anyone apologized? No, I think Lynn Buchanan, I think, has been the kindest um, to me. But Lynn was outcast, too. Mm -hmm. He was outcast, too. He was brought in by Stubblebun, and so was I. And I don't think the rest of the team was that wild about Stubblebun, because they thought he was crazy for bringing people to Monroe. And I liked Stubblebun. And um, and I think Lynn at some point had a soft talk. Lynn knew what I was going through because he went through it. I can remember one night just being at my apartment and I just felt like I gave up so much. I mean, I gave up friends. I gave up a lifestyle to leave Virginia to go to Maryland. And I'm like, what the heck am I doing? What did I do to myself? And then it just all, then it was like, hey, then things started to work out. It was like I went. So that was like an epiphany that you had. And then at that point, that's when things came together. Work. That's when I went in with Fern and I said, if you're really interested, if you really want to know, then come see this. And he did, and then he was with me. Wow. Well, I know Dale Graff, who uh, I talk to frequently these days, because uh, we're work- both working together on the um, IRVA research unit. I know how highly he's spoken of you and your work and how he continues to regard just your work as some of the best. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was a lot of fun. I mean, Dale was, yeah, but Dale was, um, yeah, and, and Ed, I think Ed's afraid, I think Ed May's afraid of channeling view. He just takes it from a, he takes it from a purely scientific thing, and he, you know, and he, I came in from the new age people. I, stu- you know, like I studied, I bought the, the metaphysical books and all of that. But I guess these scientists don't look at it like that. Did did um, Ed has continued to have you work with him on different projects, sometimes. right? Sometimes I just yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes I work for Ed, but he. I mean, he does. I do strictly ERB on his targets, but we don't. You we don't talk about. Um, I mean, with Fern, I was very open with the channeling. With Dr. Verona, v- Verona knew everything. I mean, he knew what um, tarot. I mean, <laughs> somebody complained to somebody that Robin was using tarot cards, and he was like, "So what?" <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. The divide with all of this, you know, it got. Uh, and meanwhile, you've got people out there that just think. All of this is crazy. All of us are crazy for whatever we're doing here. Yeah. And then meanwhile, you've and then got you all have these this, different factions between which doesn't help because there's oh. we're not united. No, there's so there's divisions between those doing CRV and ERV, and there's divisions now we're hearing between ERV and even channeling or mediumship. And yeah, you know, I'm coming back full circle to what does this do within our own selves and minds? And I think this talk today has proven my theory that when you had to separate yourself from what you, your full range of capabilities to fit yourself into how other people thought you should work or would find acceptable, then you weren't really doing as you were okay, but you were not what no, you were no. able to become when you just said, screw this, I'm going to do what works and not limit mm-hmm. myself. Yeah. And I knew I had Fern's backing, even Ed May, even though he couldn't admit that it was channeling per se, Ed wasn't a strong proponent of CRV, which kind of helped, helped me a little bit. That helped me in that way. But um, I think that now Fern and I feel Verona and then Bill Cohen, who went on, he was a senator, then became secretary of state. Oh, my God, he believed in anything, he, you know. And so those people knew, like, <laughs> I can remember, like, Verona saying somebody did, Robin's doing tarot cards. He's like, so what? I mean, of course she's doing tarot cards. 
Well, that that just reminded me of when I um, I had to take the GRE, the graduate entrance exam to get into graduate school. And I had already been out of school for so long and I'm not good with tests. And I was so nervous and I went in to take the test and for the writing portion of it, you had to answer like two essays. And the very first essay was the question was something like, um, there are people who believe that some people have psychic abilities. And so can you argue, present a logical argument either for or against psychic abilities? Now, what are the chances that, and this was after I had already written three books on this subject, what are the chances that that would be my subject for an essay test? Just, right. there's no way that was random. What would you tell remote viewers today that want to feel like they want to make sure that people are doing their work in like a diligent and professional manner. Um, yeah, and to be open-minded, to be open-minded. I think the protocols are wonderful. They really keep a person clean. And I, and I think that, you know, doing remote viewing, it's, it's a personal thing. It's, you know, it's how it's the inner workings of yourself. So, you know, it, you have to develop yourself and that's a lot of work for you to have your own development, but to always be open because actually the more open you can be, you are to so many possible, anything can, can, can happen to you. You begin to open up, you begin to know more, think differently. And I think, and it's a growth. I mean, you can actually grow from it, I think. I think if anything, you can go in this field, just keep an open mind, do, you know, be honest in your work, do the best that you can and keep searching. See, a lot of times remote viewers, once they found out, once they knew a methodology, they thought they knew it all and they didn't want to keep, they didn't want to progress. And so your advice would be keep progressing, keep trying out different methods and things. And did you, would you find when you would do a new kind of target that you would um, grow from that? Did, did you find that sometimes you, it took like doing a certain kind of target, like doing it a few times before you were okay? Or would you find that you would have success even the first time you had? Like sometimes I would have success the first time and sometimes I would have to go back. Um, now in the ERV, I could go back. It, oh, sometimes in CRV, but I had to know where to start from. A lot of times I was like, oh, yeah, now I'm here. But yeah, I would go back. So, yeah, several times. Sometimes you have to go back. You have to go back sometimes. And by going back, you mean like go back into session where you were yeah. in that If morning. it's complex, if it's, and things aren't easy. I mean, we did a lot of locational work. I can remember getting like two locate looking for one man, but getting two locations. I mean, what does that mean? We don't know. He could have been there, could have been there, but yeah. And when you say to um, remote viewers, well, follow the protocols, but then keep an open mind, what would you say are the most important protocols? To keep them clean, you know, like in other words, um, you know, you don't know what it is, but neither does the monitor know what the target is. Try to keep the target, that, 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 that keeps the signal down, that keeps the noise down. Monitors need to learn how to... Um, judge a judge a target too sometimes they don't know how to judge they assume that you should be they may judge you may get something of the target maybe not something that they think you should get and then they downgrade I mean sometimes they're off too so did you have that quite a bit where people would tell you no you're you're off you're wrong and then they'd come back and say no actually you were right mm -hmm. Tell me about your readings. Do you enjoy doing your personal readings? Yes. I, you know, I do a lot of them and sometimes it's almost a little too much. Like I, I try to limit myself to like one or two days a week, but then I've been getting a lot of requests. So um, I, I do, I, you know, love being able to make a difference and know that I can help people. And it's like a shortcut that they don't have to go for therapy for years. They can just get a reading and then come back and say, you know, everything changed after this reading. It really made a difference. So, 
So that's really cool. And I, I do feel like I'm always growing and expanding. And you are. Yeah. And, you know, I've been, um, I teach a mediumship class, but I also take classes in mediumship too. So I've been taking some classes through the Arthur Finley Institute in the UK, just online. And I just love, you know, learning from new teachers and they have a whole way of doing things and, you know, some very strict, um, just the, I, I think the Institute traditionally had some very dogmatic ways of how a medium is supposed to work, but the teachers that I've been encountering lately, they are seeing that, that it's important for people to depart from some of those, those practices and just do things that are in more in alignment with how they you know, feel most comfortable. So it's been good having open-minded teachers, but also mm-hmm. ones that come from a specific spiritualistic tradition. I buy a lot of, I read a lot of books on the internet. I just was something that look, you know, I just read and search and, you know. Yeah. But there was, I did one, there's a book put out by Scott Carmichael. I worked for him after um, it's called unconventional method. And he, they asked me to work a case after the, program closed down and that's an interesting it's a real easy read it's called unconventional method and I helped him catch a spy oh really it's on kindle and it's I think you get the book for 99 cents or it's free oh terrific yeah I'll, I'll look for that yeah it talks about what we did the whole story about who he is who I who I was what they were going after and he thought I was wrong and he thought I was, and then all of a sudden it, something happened and it just all clicked and he knew what I said was right and how he just went with it. And they got the guy. Who was he a spy for? It was an Australian guy. We we work with the Australians and the Canadians and the English. There was an Australian guy that was put in an imagery unit in Australia working with the United States. And he went to Singapore and his plans were to go to other countries to sell them American secrets. Usually when somebody wants to sell secrets, they go by a fake name. So they knew there was an unsub, but they didn't know who he was. How could they identify him? And I identified him. You actually came up with his name. Yes, I did. You do tend to get names, sometimes two names and uh, almost all the letters in a name or even complete names. And mm-hmm. so just anything that you, it, it sounds like it comes through when you're doing your automatic writing. Writing, yeah. Do you, will you, will it just emerge on the paper or do you ever hear it in your head? Like the name? No, it's on, it's mostly on the paper. So if you didn't write it, would you not even know it? Like you, do you just see it once it's on the paper? I see it once it's on the paper. And is the only that- other way I would see it is if I did ex- extended remote viewing. Sometimes if I do extended remote viewing, they'll show me a location on a map. But other than names or whatever, that's mostly done by automatic writing. Is there anything you've done to like improve on that? Or is that, would you just say it's just. That's what happened to me ever since I started to do automatic writing is the specific words would come up. Do you get numbers too, or mostly? Numbers? No, mostly, mostly names. Numbers are different. They're hard because it's a different uh, part of the brain that you're using. And do you, are you a numbers person to begin with? Like, do you like numbers at all? Or are you good? Uh, with- yeah, they don't bother me. But do you get numbers? Um. You know, uh, just a couple of times I've gotten numbers, but they appear like I had a target where it was, it was five or it was like a series of fives, like three fives. And I kept drawing what I thought were S's. So I thought I, I, I was like, why do I keep one? I, I'm compelled to keep writing these S's on my paper. And then it turned out the target had been a handwritten number of three fives, but I didn't know it was numbers. I thought it was the letter S, Um, but I'm, I don't get a lot of um, 
numbers at all. And it, I would say when I'm doing readings with people, I do get specific names, but I wouldn't say in my remote viewing sessions that, that I've to- had too many, maybe a couple of times I have um, of, of right. very specific, specific uh, places that were not well-known places, but the names I've had that maybe twice, but I would say it's usually when I'm on the phone with someone And then also a lot of times it is in context with someone who passed away, like, and especially like if the name was significant, like, let's say um, um, someone lost their father and then they name their son, the same name after the father, then the name will just come and uh, it'll be like, it pops in my mind or I hear it. Um, But I haven't really, you know, I've, I've been trained in, controlled remote viewing and extended remote viewing. Um, But I haven't done a whole lot of automatic writing. Um, So I think that might be something I might like to try. I would do it. But you do mediumship, though. You're medium, right? That's the same thing. Yeah, it's more just um, uh, having it come in through auditory or through thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, but I'm feeling very inspired after hearing how, how you've worked. And I think that would be fun to just, you know, try more of automatic writing. I do find that a lot of times I'm able to produce sketches that are, you know, pretty, pretty accurate. Um, but yeah, I really feel like it is the ability to come up with those names um, that is really also so, so necessary for solving cases. And Mm -hmm. I think that remote viewers really would do well if they can do whatever is possible to improve in that area. Oh, sure. Because I mean, you can always describe something, but if you're looking for something, what, what is the description? You need the location. Because Ed is against the idea, at least now, I don't know if he was always against this, but he's against the idea that people can learn remote viewing or they can get better yeah that's not true because it's innate you can develop it yeah you just have to know how to bring it out of yourself and how to and that's what uh, teaches ed and i have had that ongoing debate and then it has had an impact on you know some of just what you're trying to do Joe, Joe McMonagall did not, Joe wasn't a psychic. He, he didn't do psychic work before he came into the unit, right? Like he right. may have shown, you know, signs that he could be, a, he could but be. But Joe good. did not consider, Joe did not consider himself a psychic until he went into the unit. I believe so, Joe had the abilities and things happened to him, but he did not say I am psychic before he went into that unit. And then he so, went into it and then skip out water or whoever had to show him at least, you know, this, like do this, right? Like someone had to say, do these steps and then this will work. Yeah, yeah. And so that when I say, you know, training makes a difference, it you know, it, it, that's what I mean is like, you have to, if no one tells you, okay, sit down with a piece of paper now try this or sit, imagine this, if they just don't tell you that, then you're just not going to know. And, you know, that's training doesn't have to be any more, you know, complicated. I mean, it, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, I think it takes a lot to just even do what you did to go to school and study this. And I mean, there, I mean, I tell you, this government just burned me out, just burned me out. Um, well, school did for for sure. Like, I really don't want to have anything to do with academia. I don't. I I am not cut out to be part of an organizational structure and deal with. I mean, I, I was thinking when you were talking about some of what you went through. I, I went through similar things, you know, in my department, in my even now, you know, you would think. And I went to a school that's supposed to be like open to, you know, parapsychology and stuff, but just went through just craziness and it, so much of it's just about the people's personalities and egos and power. Bureaucracies trip. are difficult. Bureaucracies yeah. are hard. It doesn't matter if it's government schools, what I mean, in mili- intelligence and military and mail, oh, all of that. And it wasn't even any better when I got out of there either, but you know what? I'm fine. I mean, we survived it. We go through our karmas. 
Yeah, that that really is what it is, I think, right? And then we just get over it and can just be by ourselves in our happy places with the people that we like and choose and, you know. Mm -hmm.